Okay. okay, welcome, 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 everybody. We um, are hosting tonight's, what are we talking about tonight? Buy and hold. Buy and hold. Right, buy and hold. And so for those that don't know, my name is Rob Chavez. I'm one of the facilitators of Grid Wrestling. So welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. And as always, what we love to do is kind of start off by letting you guys introduce yourselves very quickly. 10 second elevator pitch. Who are you? What do you do? What are you looking for? If you've got a deal that you want to share, now is kind of the, the time to say, hey, I've got this deal I want to talk about. If you are brand new to the business, just say, I'm brand new. I'm here to learn. If, you, if it's your first time here, just let us know, too, so we can tell you what Grid is all about. Yeah, we can connect you guys, right? I mean, ultimately, Grid is a real estate network that empowers you guys to be able to get the education, the inspiration, the relationships to be able to do deals at the local level. Right. We've got 30,000 members across the country run by 40 leaders across the country. So not only do we have a community here, we've got a community all over the country that people can tap into. Right. Uh, one of our latest offices is in Knoxville. Knoxville is a great place to invest right now. And I was doing a podcast yesterday with somebody that they specifically are targeting the Knoxville market. I'm like, great. I'll introduce them to a team. Right. So this feels weird that he's sneaking up on me. <laughs> Uh, but why don't why don't we let you guys introduce yourself real fast? Go ahead, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Norma. Get and learn. Welcome, Thank welcome, you. welcome. Go ahead. My name is Mike. I'm a member of the Casa Group, and I'm an agent and investor. Um, on the investor side, I'm looking at other markets like Knoxville right now, since interest rates went up. It's a little bit harder to make things work here. And then, as an agent, I help. I help investors, often first-time investors, um, specifically house hacking. Um, I help people house hack. Probably. We call him the house hacking king. That's yeah. like, right. Go ahead. Tim Tower. I moved here about a year ago. We're looking to buy a house in this area. Once we get established with our own home, then we're going to start looking at investor properties. Right. Make hands in awesome area. Indeed. Right. right. Go ahead. I'm Sloan Wiesen. I'm a rest and realtor. I do some buy and hold investing, and I... Just recently dipped my toe in a little private lending. So buy and hold and private lending. And uh, uh, I, I help out clients in the rest and then surrounding areas. So good to see you, Sloan. Likewise. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Akash. I live in Ajibran. Uh, so this is my second, second meetup. Uh, I'm over here to see if I can find my first rental uh, truck. It's local or any other market, but I can in the other outside market stand up. Scary because this is my first time. So, or how I will be able to be working out since my career. That's all. Great. Welcome. Go ahead. Hey, I'm Nibian. Um, should live in New York. Um, I'm buying some fixer uppers here and renting them out. Um, I have a handful of properties in the northern Virginia area. Great. Go ahead. Hey. Justin Shutters. I have a couple buying goals, uh, but my full-time job is I am a commercial lender with Bank of Clark. We have a office in Tyson's Corner and other branches in Northern Virginia. So uh, any commercial property or any one to four family dwelling uh, that's held in an LLC or corporation, I can help you out with that, including FERS. I had a couple a couple people last week were asking me for your information. So we got to make sure that we got it out. Like I was like, I didn't have it readily on hand. I got to make sure I have it readily on hand. And Mark, I think got your email. Yeah. So Justin uh, brought pizza, except he didn't because I didn't tell him until he pulled into the parking lot. But yeah, we're going. Uh, next next time, we might even feed you because Justin made us a wonderful offer and we're going to take him up on it. Cool. Uh, Thank you, Justin. Go ahead. Turn him back. Uh, my name's Carl. Uh, this is my third attempt. I'm getting real estate. Okay. But it's also my first time at this meetup. I uh, heard good things about it when I met Ali over the weekend. So I'm here. Uh, my objectives I'm looking for folks that can help me out with wholesaling. And also, I'm looking for folks that can help me out with financing as well. So I'll love to chat with you and see how that can work out. But uh, I have some cash that's set aside in the trust. I'd like to use that. But then again, I'd just see if I could probably do, you know, you know no money down type of plan. Financing, there's got to be some creative ways to do this. So that's the second thing I'm looking for. And the third thing is anyone that's involved with um, small apartment buildings, maybe eight, 10, maybe 12 units, I'm looking to do that, but also bounce some ideas and kind of um, talk to you about that. In addition to doing some fix and flip, 
but I'm planning for the long term. So I need passive income. So that's why I'm looking for the small apartment. So if anyone's in that, we're up to uh, you know, chat with it before you head on out today. Okay. Yeah. Thank One you. of the things I'm going to recommend everybody do if you haven't done it is that we have uh, a 5,000 member Facebook group that's completely free where you can go in and start tapping to pe tapping into people from across the country. So there might be some other markets that you want to explore as well, besides this there area, is, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So go ahead, you know, it's just, I think it's great. Community so that's a uh, Facebook, uh, great Facebook communities. At the end of the slides, we'll have the link for that. So make sure you take a picture and you can go and sign up. You have to be approved to be a member of that, but the link is on our slide. Yeah, the link is on the slides, right. Okay, go ahead, introduce yourself. I am Jen Flair, um, involved in all things real estate, just trying to network and get back more into investing. Good to see you again. Go ahead. Great. Good to have you here. Hi, uh, my name is Naman. Uh, I'm not in real estate. I work in the tech industry, but I help uh, my dad who is in real estate, and I've been managing our one of our residential properties for the last eight years and I've been really getting into the numbers and really I'm just here as an observer and looking to understand how in this area like the Nova area how people are buying and renting out residential or commercial properties and getting them to cash flow because I've been looking at my numbers and I'm not able to get it to cash flow yeah so I'm talking about looking to learn a lot about that tonight's about that yeah. tonight's about that so welcome How's it going, everybody? My name is Coleman Bales. Um, I work for Atlantic Coast Mortgage. I'm a residential loan officer, so I do loans for the cost group and residential loans, that is. Um, but the real reason I'm here is that I'm also a real estate investor. Um, I own a couple of different rentals out in Winchester because cash flow. Um, I've done a couple of flips over the years, but um, yeah, just here to learn more and uh, kind of network and, you know, what have you. Awesome. Uh, my name is Tony Maceo. I'm an agent with Casa. I'm a hunter, so if there's a specific area and neighborhood that you want to get into and you're interested in, let me know. Break down the door and get you in. Yeah, yeah. Um, really and I'm and I'm the here. concept means hunt or pursue. Yeah, Did you know that? I knew it. But, I'm <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm here to master the buying hole just like everybody else here. So awesome. Good having you here. Hello, everyone. My name is Jared Dukes. I am a um, I'm an agent with uh, New Western Acquisitions. I'm a dispositions agent, so I uh, help uh, investors purchase their next investment or their first investment. Uh, currently, we are nationwide um, in about 60 metros, um, and we're helping about 150,000 investors across the nation. Uh, this uh, disposition have about a property every 13 minutes, so we're, we're pretty proud of that. So anyone who's interested in um, getting their first or their next uh, rental. Um, I was definitely, that's what I'm looking to do. Yeah, I think the first time I heard about you guys, I might've been five years ago and I bought a property in St. Petersburg, Florida, nice. right? In St. Pete. I was like, oh, these guys legit. Like they followed up with me, they, they made the calls. And then it was like very persistent, like I'm a business guy. So I'm like really good follow-up the email follow-up, the call follow-up. And I was like, oh, they've got a system. Mm -hmm. And then I started noticing that you guys expanded and you rapidly expanded over the last yes. three or four years, right? So we need to talk. Absolutely. To, like, love to understand a little bit more about that, right? Well, um, go ahead, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Shivaji Prasad. I do tax and accounting. I am doing since the last 13 years. And I have expertise in real estate taxation as well as other businesses like partnership, S corporation, C corporation, non profits, and so on. Thank yeah. you. PhD, master mathematician, <laughs> want to figure out how your numbers work. <laughs> Somebody to talk to. Go ahead. Hey, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Brent Weiner. Uh, I started as an investor and love it so much. I joined on the account team as an agent as well. So help others do the same exact thing. Uh, got my first property and our contract on number two as we speak. Nice. Yeah. And I do the, the short term rentals and I don't know what I've been doing first. So engineer by Airbnb. engineer by trade, numbers person by trade, right? So no PhD though, so <laughs> <laughs> Good. Black and run Excel. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm also an agent with the Casa 
not an engineer, no desire to be one. My dad is an engineer, my brother and his wife are engineers. Um, I am also a real estate planner, help people downsize and protect their wealth when they're downsizing. <laughs> protect their wealth while they're downsizing and they keep more of their money instead of giving it away to the IRS. So that's yeah. what I do. Yeah, she's a planner. And also that. avoid family feuds because you can't divide yep. real estate. So I hope we'll plan ahead for the future. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So tonight, right? Is that anyone Oh, oh right. go ahead. Hey, do you know why? It's because we introduced our in, in the beginning. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Hi, everyone. Uh, Eric Palmer, I currently uh, work in the tech industry uh, for about a year, and I can say I already know that's not something I want to do forever, so I've been looking around, obviously found real estate investing, still new to it, but uh, looking to make some connections and hopefully learn from one of you all and get, uh, get into the market. Awesome. What, what I will say before I let you guys go, right, is, because uh, I'm going to let you guys kind of take over, is the purpose, the reason why we started this like the reason why Mark and I have been running this community, this specific one, for the last 14 years, 14 years, the first Tuesday of every month, right, is because we understand that the relationships in here is what fuels investors. Okay, that's what fuels you. So we've seen people come in here with zero knowledge and then build massive portfolios of properties. And we enjoy seeing that. We enjoy seeing that process. Somebody from zero to, you know, 50, 20, you know, what, 100 I've seen units. stories. Uh, Carl was here Saturday. We're talking about Jason, who started coming to Korea and now doing great things with multifamily. On multifamily, like yeah, yeah, for sure. A um, couple of great wins. We like to share great <laughs> wins. So by the way, if you have a wins along the way, like always, let us know. We just had one of our uh, grid one one good friend of mine who's a grid member do her first deal and make two hundred thousand dollars on her first deal. Right. So we'll so celebrate her next week because she's actually in St. Michael right now vacationing with some friends. So next so next month, right, we'll probably celebrate that. I'm going to send out in my newsletter, kind of talk a little bit about the breakdown of how she did that deal. But a lot of it just came down to knowing the right people, asking the right questions, and then executing on a strategy that we talk about in here like all the time. 200,000 right? wholesaling like really quickly. Uh, seven days. Yeah. It was a seven day assignment, right? And so it's one of the strategies that we talk about. Now that's active income. What we want to teach you tonight is more about how do you build passive income in your life? I call, there's this game that we're all playing, whether you know you're playing it or not. It's called the income flip, right? Where you flip your active income into passive income. And it takes some time. You need to understand the strategies behind it. But completely doable, especially within the world of real estate, the game that we're playing, right? So tonight is about buying and holding. We'll over cover a topic. We'll talk about 45 minutes to an hour, guys. 45 minutes to an hour. Okay. 45 minutes to an hour, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's right. And then and then and then we're gonna let you guys do what we believe is the most powerful part is exchanging information, putting each other in each other's databases and communicating, right? So uh with that, who are you? Run a couple slides, uh, since we've only got 45 minutes to an hour. Let's yeah, run through this really quickly. Uh, so, Rob, you talked about who we are and what we're doing and maybe what we're not, right? Uh, we are uh, educators by nature, but not professional guru trainer types. We're just going to kind of talk about what this business is for us and how it works. Hopefully it connects some dots for you. Uh, my name is Mark Beckett, and I've been connecting dots with Rob, as he said, for about 14 years now. Um, I have done flips and rehabs and some buy and holds and some short-term rentals and long-term rentals and trying to maybe do a mid-term rental uh, soon. That seems like a pretty interesting space. But what I do uh, for most of most days is run a law office called Casa Construction uh, that does pre-sale renovations for investors, agents, and their clients. If anyone here wants to spend the very least amount that they possibly can and sell for the absolute most that is absolutely available in the marketplace, that's what we do. We do it for investors and their agents and uh, their clients, right? And Skylar with my group is right here in the front. Her information on the back of this. So if anyone would like more information about that service, please do give us a shout. We'd love to help you out. So that's what I do. Ali, what do you My do? name is Ali Dovar. I've been with Casa since 2019, been in real estate since 2014, I think. 
Uh, starting real estate, really interested in the business, but in the first couple of years, was just trying to figure out how it works, how sales works. So when I came across Kaza and Rob, I joined and really learned the business at a high level. I helped Rob uh, run parts of the business that really taught me what sales is about. You could, it could be real estate sales, it could be mortgage, it could be any sales, it's just a numbers game. Really learning that, then I got serious about my financial freedom. So I had a conversation with Rob, went back to being a real estate agent full time and really focusing on helping people build wealth through real estate, through investing, working with builders, developers, and really helping people solve difficult problems in real estate, right? So if you got any special case or anything around building or, uh, or anything like that, I'm, I'm your guy. Right now, uh, we do a couple of buildings that we have for sale in DC. We have a, one building for sale. We have two more coming up. Uh, so that's uh, like a new area we're exploring that's super exciting. Cool. All right. What else we got? Uh, yeah, our mission, Rob, already kind of talked about making the uh, connecting the dots for people. Uh, we're looking for people here of all levels, right? It's not just about uh, people who've done this for a million years, but new uh, investors can uh, get a lot out of this information as well. We're growing. Uh, the best thing that you can do for yourself, honestly, if you think there's any value in any of this whatsoever, is tell everybody else you know. The more people who come to events like this, the more business we'll all be able to do, the more deals we'll be able to find partners and money and opportunities and all of it. The vast majority of my business, my flips, my rehabs, my money that I borrow, that I've lent, business partners, friends, all of it has come from this activity. I know it works. It'll work for every single one of you because probably most of you are much smarter than I am. So just tell everyone you know that this thing is happening and it will work for you too, right? So that's, that's the power of getting together and talking about what we do. So that's what we're doing. We talked about you and we talked about legal slide. stuff. Yeah, uh, I'm not an attorney. He's not a, an accountant that I'm aware of uh, and do your own due diligence, right? Uh, and then the other thing legally, I think you need to know this is being recorded. So if you're not cool with that, get out. Uh, but otherwise, we're not going to like zoom in on anybody's faces. But do know we do record this stuff. And you'll be able to find those recordings later. We'll talk about that in a bit. All right. So housekeeping stuff uh, out of the way. Buy and hold is what we're here to talk about. Because as Rob said, it is probably one of the most transformative things human beings have ever discovered. The fact that I can own a thing, have someone else pay for it. I make money in the meantime while it goes up in value. Great. Uh, it is exactly what we're trying to do. Uh, what does it say here uh, next? Yeah, the basic definition of a buy and hold property is any property that you purchase with the intent of owning it while someone else is paying for it. Technically, it also uh, would cover commercial real estate, but we actually talk about that separately because there's other stuff to think about um, for commercial versus residential. But one of the things that we do want to talk about is the difference between being a long-term residential investor and a short-term uh, rehabber, flipper, or whatever you want to call it, renovator. We do that too, uh, but this is where real wealth gets built. You can make good money renovating. I make good money renovating, uh, but you make it, it's done. It's ordinary income. You pay the absolute maximum uh, amount of taxes on it that you can pay on any kind of income, and then you're out of business as soon as that house gets sold. So while that business is good and wholesaling is good for the amount of money you can make for the effort, buy and hold and owning assets over the long term that you're not paying for and that hopefully are putting cash in your pocket while someone else is paying for it is one of the great wealth, wealth creators right? Uh, that mankind's ever developed. I think also long term, like uh, the way I looked at it, like this year, really specially, like there are some people around me that went through some difficulties, like somebody had a stroke that, that couldn't really walk anymore and like having to actually not cash out of some things, right? And in our world of real estate investment, we're always looking at the next deal, right? As an agent, as an investor, what we talk about that's active income, right? That's money I'm like working for when I'm working, it's coming and the moment I stop working, it's, it's not gonna be there anymore. Now, if I have a job that I get $50 an hour, $100 an hour, um, the question is if I go and do some like real estate investment, let's say I'm gonna do some wholesaling or flipping, I'm taking my time and doing something else. Some of you are in sales and in sales, sometimes it's like, I can do more of what I'm doing. As an agent, I don't need to go find a flip. I can just go deeper in what I do. So not get distracted, but creating wealth to create passive income is totally a different game, right? So really being aware of like, I'm the dollar per hour, like what's the best use of my time, but also what do I do with this money? So as I get 
Older, as life changes, my standard of living doesn't change or go down, but I'm actually able to create security for myself and for my family. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, security for yourself and your family uh, doesn't really come up in the topic tonight, but if you have the ability to take a note, take a quick note. Google stepped up basis for me uh, when you get a second. Here's one of the best things about real estate. Keep it for as long as you can, preferably die with it, uh, because when uh, anyone inherits real estate from you, they inherited what's called the stepped up basis. If you bought it for a dollar and it's worth a million dollars the day you die and you pass real estate to someone else, their basis for tax purposes is the million dollars that it's worth today. And that million dollars you've made on it as it's increased in value in order to them tax free. If it goes up another million dollars, they sell it in their lifetime, maybe they'll have to pay the taxes on that. But stepped up basis is one of the currently available uh, wonderful tax advantages to long-term real estate. Uh, so of which there are many, many more, and maybe we'll even talk about a couple of them. So considerations then for buy and hold, uh, slightly different than they are for a flip, but a few things are the same, right? I think we talk about in the next slide a couple of things. Yeah, a couple of things uh, you're going to need to know if you're going to invest in anything, how much cash do you have? Does take a certain amount of cash. There are creative ways to acquire real estate that don't require as much cash, but the easy way, typical way is to have some amount of cash that's uh, the equity in the uh, property that you don't borrow uh, to pay for it. You can buy all in cash, of course. We believe in properly debt leveraged real estate though, because it tends to increase the return on your investment using proper leverage, which we'll talk about in a second. I think we've got some people here that can talk specifically about leverage and what it costs and what it does for you. Um, your long-term strategy, obviously, as I'm saying, these are lifetime assets, perhaps even beyond your lifetime. So know what your time horizon is for investing. Uh, some people like fix and flip because in six months you are done and Hopefully, as long as that project goes well, you wash your hands of it, you move on, you do whatever else you want in life. An asset that you own forever will probably need something occasionally to be done. How you do that and who does that is the thing we can talk about, but it does involve you in the thing. Involving you in the thing, owning anything uh, means it's going to need to get fixed up. You're going to need to borrow money. You're going to need to put somebody in it. You're going to have agents involved. So there's that know that I necessarily want to call it hassle is not really a hassle, but those people will be in your life. So understand what your capacity is for dealing with the people, right, that are going to be involved in your business of owning things. Um, and then risk tolerance is another thing. Uh, if you own a thing, there's always some amount of risk involved in owning a thing that's got some attachment to you. There are ways to remove and obfuscate that attachment to you. And we can maybe talk more about that because that gets into a little bit deeper stuff that we can chat about just in 45 minutes to an hour. But risk tolerance is a thing that you need to understand. And then uh, what else do you get on uh, your money? Investing in other things. Real estate is one of the things that we uh, believe is one of the greatest investments, but you'd probably done all right if you just stuck all your mattress money in Tesla stock uh, for the last couple of years. So know what your options are know what your return is, know what your money costs you, so then you can appropriately uh, run numbers on real estate, see if it makes sense, right? Uh, yeah, and then where you wanna hold rental properties, we'll talk in a second about where we do most of our uh, buy and holds, but spoiler alert, it's not usually in really great neighborhoods, it's not really terrible neighborhoods, we're looking for little market stuff. Uh, how long do you intend to keep it? We talked about how are you gonna manage uh, a property or two? Are you gonna manage a dozen? properties uh, that may change and that will change your costs and it will change who you need to know to get it done uh oh and then rate of appreciation that that's part of it there are things beyond just the rent that affect your income on a property will it appreciate or not do you have tax benefits or not for other activity that can be washed by uh, the property that you own long term uh, so understand those things uh, and the more you kind of understand about, about where your money comes from and what it costs you and what you're taxed at, the, the better sense you can make of your real estate deals when you're looking at it, right? And that takes a thing that might just be, oh, it's a thing I own for a couple hundred dollars and turn it into a thing that is worth tens of thousands of dollars a year to you if you understand leverage, arbitrage, taxes, uh, and those things. So we encourage you to do that work and, and understand those things as well. Make sense? 
Um, all right, so buy and hold uh, as far as middle market property go. How many people do we know that own a lot of rental properties in uh, McLean and Great Falls? Not a whole lot. Not very many. I think I'm, I'm maybe aware of a couple people who just have owned them for a long time, maybe lived in them as their original residence, then moved out, had a reasonable enough basis, and they were able to kind of rent it out and make sense. Um, but I think someone was asking earlier, like, I'm looking for deals around here. It's really hard to make the numbers work. You better believe it is. Uh, I don't own anything in McLean or Great Falls, and we don't own a heck of a lot in Reston, although we were able to pick a few up uh, at the last downturn, right, in Reston and Herndon. Uh, when the market changed and when the market dropped, we were able to acquire properties at numbers that kind of made sense. But by and large, we're not investing uh, in our long-term rental portfolio in nicer neighborhoods because the numbers are just really hard. And this is just fundamental macroeconomics. The rent cap is where it is in an area. There's only so much free income that people have to spend on their housing, right? Uh, the value of the house might be here, meaning the hold cost, unless you own it entirely in cash, if you have any debt on it at all, may likely be higher than that rent ceiling for what people are able to pay. How do these houses get sold? Because people buy them for the appreciation, but your tenant doesn't get any appreciation. You get the appreciation. That's one of the wonderful things about being a landlord. Uh, but that does mean that there is a ceiling uh, typically on the rental market and the cost of holding can exceed that uh, income potential in high dollar markets. That's why it's hard. That's just kind of how the, the math works. You can, if you have all cash and don't need to borrow much or borrow very little, still make the numbers work, right? It's all just debt to, to income. And actually maybe Justin can talk in a minute about things like debt to income ratios as it affects your loan. So if you borrow very little, fine. Maybe that monthly rent will cover what your borrowing costs are, but does it make sense to do? When you say that, like everybody that I know that has rentals in Great Falls and McLean are people that make money somewhere else. They're not real estate investors. They're just parking their money, right? Yeah. Or they just don't want to sell that house yet, or there's a reason for it. Because if you really look at your cash on cash return, like why would I not divide this into multiple properties and let the appreciation work better for me or right. borrow against it versus like just buying that, that expensive property is usually not a good investment compared to. Correct. Yours. Right. Because that, that cash is not generating a very good return, even if you don't have much debt on it, because a million dollar house is still only going to rent for five, six thousand dollars a month, maybe the nicest house uh in the area just about and even if you can make a couple hundred dollars on a million dollar investment that doesn't make as much sense as buying something in areas where we're buying and in this area that means Herndon, Woodbridge, Manassas, Winchester uh sometimes even farther out depending on where the market is than Stafford. that Stafford um I think I already mentioned Woodbridge but farther away right I think half an hour at least from here and out, generally not towards DC, kind of half an hour out west, uh, was where the numbers will tend to make a little bit more sense. Um, I'm not a big fan of investing in low income, high crime areas myself, uh, because I find that that decreases the quality of the tenant, increases the amount of maintenance required on the property, but that's just me. Anybody here own uh, Section 8 housing or housing in a lower income area, what's your experience been with that? Um, in retrospect, I wish that I had done it differently. Those are my early, my ones early on I've learned since then. Okay. You know. and, and lower income or income subsidized uh, rental property is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just not a thing that I think I am able to speak directly to. I do know people who uh, own exclusively Section 8 government subsidized rental housing and love it, do very well. There's something to be said for having someone else besides the tenant responsible for making the bulk of the rent payment. But it is a specialized kind of ownership. And I think it's a specialized kind of management experience that you need to be uh, aware of and prepared for. So the bulk of what we typically invest in and see invested in are what I'll call kind of side metro markets, not the main market. Uh, 
just because the numbers tend to work better in those kind of not as expensive in inner area metro markets. You would talk about zone, right? Um, and I know we've changed it around a little bit, but like Z O N E, like zero in on your target market, own the mind share and the market share. So zero in on a target market, like somebody might start out and, and trying to figure out what is the area that I, the best sweet spot for me to buy rentals. Is it is it the higher market, mid tier market, lower market? Is it condos, is it townhouse? It might be different for like there might be a smart and good answer, but there's also gray areas where maybe it's good for Mark, but it's not good for me, right? Maybe I want to take high risk. I'm younger. I can maybe tolerate that risk and somebody else doesn't want to. So I have met people like in DC, it's more difficult, but there's also more like, you know, section eight housing, but there are people that own massive amounts. And with that, they can actually have a little bit of pull and get what they want done. I met a guy who uh, builds massive amount just in like Trinidad area of DC. Mm -hmm. right? And he was telling me, I don't care what the zoning law is. They can't break the law. But when I go to the zoning office, they'll just approve things because I'm creating housing, right? They'll work with me where someone else is just trying to get past the red tape, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes you figure out what your zone is and it works for you. So right now we're trying to, trying to figure out what works best for each one of us. Yep. Can, I, can I make a quick comment? Yeah. Okay. Um, by the way, everybody like Mark's shoes? You gotta show, you gotta show everybody his shoes. I like your did, right? did the internet yeah. care about biohacks? Yeah, there you go. they're cool. Biohacks internet. Um, I interviewed a guy on my podcast the other day and he at one point owned 200 houses, right? 200 houses in kind of what you would call lower income. Average rent was around seven to $800. And he thought that getting to 100 would make him free, right? Because that was kind of like what he'd heard, what he'd been taught, right? But he learned something different, right? What he learned was, the product that he was buying was older products. So they'd buy the house, they'd renovate the house. But then the tenant pool that was getting pulled into these, you know, houses that was attracted to these neighborhoods would, would turn over like often. And so what would happen was these neighborhoods would turn over often. The property would get written hard, right? There'd be a lot of de deferred maintenance over time that would occur in those assets. And the asset values, it's like deferred maintenance always hits you at the most inopportune times, right? It's like, oh my God, all of a sudden, you know, you start multiplying a hundred houses and a hundred roofs and a hundred HVACs. And it was like, it was like an alligator that was eating me like up. And he said, well, what had to happen was we, we learned that we needed to start divesting of some of those assets and buying newer product, right? And we started building newer product and we started focusing on the rent uh, to build to rent market. And he said, what happened was our income started skyrocketing, right? Our headaches went down tremendously. We now owned a better product, which attracted a better tenant, right? He was like, yeah, while on paper, if you ran the numbers, it, they didn't look as good, right? In reality, it worked out 10 times better. Right, because sometimes you can get attracted to these lower income markets, and you go, "I can buy a duplex for fifty thousand dollars. The rents are a thousand dollars a month. Oh my God, that that looks ridiculously awesome." And then you rea you realize that that's not reality. You can tell people this guy it's you. Yeah, yeah. Well, well no, no, no. That, that, that wasn't me. Right. But yes, I have experienced that. Right. Um, no, this 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 guy. Right. Well, yeah, he had his own. His was in Florida. Right. right. Like his you, market, had, you had the exact same situation. I had the same situation, right? People have this happen in Baltimore a lot of times, yeah. or they'll go to different parts of Ohio and experience that. Or West Virginia. Or West Virginia experience that. So you have to, we're, what we're doing is we're just telling you there's a, kind of like a sweet spot where you could play it safe, right? Kind of think about school, like think about the school district and like where you might want to attract some of that mid-tier market, not super high end, because as Mark said, the numbers just don't work and not lower end, don't be seduced by the numbers or what they look like, they could be kind of like that mid market. It's just, it's like Goldilocks, right? It's just right, right? Because if we're in good school districts, like if my child starts at a certain grade, I want them to finish, right? Yeah. So I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna be your tenant for several years. Now, vacancy is very expensive for landlords, right? Vacancy is the most expensive. The most expensive. Right? Mm -hmm. So we care about tenants staying long-term. So therefore, those mid-tiers usually actually, you end up with people that want to stay longer, they take care of the property better, 
when they move out, you don't have to like renovate everything. They stay longer. And then also like your MT one month, sometimes we're trying to increase the rent by a hundred dollars to gain 1200 bucks, but I'm MT one month. And let's say the rent is $2,000. I'm losing money, right? Yeah. Wor workforce housing here in Reston, Herndon, Sterling market is like so strong. It's so strong. Now it's hard to make the numbers work because of where interest rates are today, but I've had tenants with me for 16 years, right? And the majority of them have been like that. And they just raise their families there. And this, this is a great market. The challenge becomes, and I'll shut up and leave again. The challenge becomes, I know, how do you find those deals, right? That's always like the question, right? Like everybody knows, hey, we're gonna make money off of buying and holding assets, but how do you find the deals? So Mark, I have a fun series. So you can look in places other than here. You mentioned uh, Florida, right? Yeah. Uh, as it happens, pitch for- How do you the deals here? Mark? We have locations in Florida, mm -hmm. Texas, uh, California, Pennsylvania, uh, in tertiary markets where I think the uh, numbers work a little bit easier. That though requires boots on the ground in those markets. So you'll need to find those people. Again, use networks like Grid to uh, discover those markets, meet people in those markets and find the people that you would need to perhaps invest outside of your market. Just make sure you understand how you're going to get a, a property renovated, most particularly managed long-term. Uh, tenants managed, dealt with the legal things done that need to be done. Uh, but it can be done and that's possible. Well, there's also like deals even in this market, like what you're saying, like you find what you're looking for, right? Like if I tell myself there is no deals, I won't see it. But if I actually believe that in every market, like Tokyo is crazy, right? But you will find deals there. So if, you, if I say, you know, there are deals here, two things. One, I might have to go a little, let's say I'll go to Stafford or Woodbridge. That's one thing. There's good, good areas that, that you can find, you know, good cash flowing properties. But also right here, sometimes I might find a deal that needs work, but sometimes I might also find a deal that doesn't need any work that somebody's willing to sell. We came across a deal in Manassas, Mike Capello had about a year and a half ago, and this gentleman had bought a property and was going to sell it. I mean, he had renovated it already only because he had he found bed bugs and to him it was the end of the world, something that you can fix for like a thousand dollars. He was taking, if I remember correctly, a $50,000 loss on it. So if I say there are deals out there, I'm going to network with people that I think they're going to bring me deals. I'm going to stay in contact with them. Human nature is usually we take action towards what belief gives us results. So if I believe there's no results out of going to grid and networking with people, I won't do it. Therefore, nothing happens. But if I come consistently here and consistently network and consistently go on MLS and do that, I'm going to find deals. I have a gentleman I work with, one of my clients. As all we're trying to figure out how to find this deals, this guy has his own license. He finds deals and then we sell it for him. He buys four to five houses a month on average. And I'm always like, and he finds all of them on MLS. He just looks on MLS, he finds them, he goes and gets them. So while we're here trying to figure out how to find deals, somebody believes there are deals and he just goes in every day and he finds them, you know? Several ways to do it. Like that, brute force, look for everything that's available for sale or find the people that you've been talking about that we call the motivated sellers, right? Everybody's looking for a deal. Nobody's looking for a deal. You're looking for somebody to help. Uh, that's what you want, the motivated seller. We're buying a house now um, in Manassas at a really good deal because it's a motivated seller. They have a problem and it's a problem that we're able to solve. So that's how you're able to find deals now. Uh, what I would also tell you, if we're talking about human nature, uh, investor nature should always be uh, to be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy, right? You may have heard that expression before. Uh, I'll shorten it to never waste a recession. If uh, you hear that housing has uh, slowed down and it's a terrible time to be buying real estate and builders are closing and people are being foreclosed on and there's blood in the streets, go max out every credit card you have. <laughs> I would be doing this presentation from a yacht right now if I had been a little bit smarter in 2008, 9, and 10, right, when uh, there was massive opportunity. We really could literally just buy what was available for sale on the open market and still have it cash flow. Single family houses in Manassas, $80,000. Townhouses in Reston for $110,000. Townhouses in Herndon that rent for $1,000 a month for $100,000. Nuts. 
But when everyone's trying to figure out how to do a short sale and how to avoid foreclosure, you hear those things, that's when you need to be ready. Right now, it's tough. We're, we don't know. We're here, here. I don't know. We're not here. Here felt different. And when it feels different, that's when you should be running out with both hands and trying to get your hands on everything you can. On a long enough time horizon, real estate always works. Nine years. If I buy it, I can sit on it for 10 to 12 years on average at most. And if I bought at the absolute top of the market, it'll do this and then it'll get to here, right? And the difference between here to here depends on the market, depends on the recession, depends on a bunch of things, but it's never more than a decade. Just about anywhere you've ever heard of or you would care to invest in, right? So the best time to buy real estate was yesterday. The second best time is right now. Don't be so afraid of market cycles, but especially don't be afraid of a recession. Get out there and buy stuff when it feels like it's a terrible time and everybody says, why would you ever want to buy a, a, a house? That's when you need to buy five. So don't race to recession. Look for motivated sellers at any time and then find a motivated seller during recession. You'll probably just have a really good. So the framework we have at Grid, and I think it's coming up later, uh, prospecting, networking and marketing. So uh, there's three the ways we can find deals, right? The guy who gets on MLS every day and tries to find deals or make calls, he's prospecting for the deals, right? So I'm going to every day find who's like on the foreclosure list, find out who needs to like sell, like, prospect would like uh, call wholesalers, for example, these are all prospecting. This is networking. You're coming here that you find new people that, that can bring you deals. So I'm gonna network with new people, put them in my database, stay in contact with them, schedule a cup of coffee and work the database, not just put them in a CRM, but actually work it. And third is marketing. I believe in the beginning, like first of all, you treat this as a business. So if you have no revenue, you don't have a marketing budget, but once you have a revenue, you put a per percentage of your revenue towards your marketing budget. And not just like we buy uglyhouses.com or some of those companies, you start actually marketing for deals to come your way. So those are the three ways that at Grid we find is in any sales job, whether it's finding homes to buy as an investor or as an agent or as a, any type of sales job, those are the three ways to find deals. 100%. And what else we got? We're totally on the slide. Talk about market all night. Uh, okay, so what do we do once we've got these properties? Mostly... We just got to fix what's broken. I try to fix very little at all if I don't need to, if I think the house is currently in relatively close to rentable condition. Uh, it occasionally happens that a house is in so bad a shape that it's got to be renovated either way. By the way, every one of our uh, rental properties would have made good rehabs. Not all of our rehabs would have made good rentals for that same reason I was talking about before, uh, about the cost of the market. I can buy that house in McLean for 500, put 200 in it and sell it for 950. Those numbers made sense. I can't buy it for five, even only put a hundred in it because I'm, I'm buying it for five in McLean. It probably needs a bunch of work and then rent it out, leverage and have it make any sense. But all of our rental properties just about always have five to six figures worth of equity in them by the time that they're done being uh, rented, renovated and rented and occupied. Uh, but the way we get that out is one of the R's in Burr. So one of the things you may have heard of is the Burr strategy, buy, renovate, buy, renovate, rent, yeah. refinance, yeah. repeat, right? And so the refinance is whatever it takes you to get the property bought, fixed up, and have, it, have a tenant put in it, uh, maybe cash, hard money, uh, DSCR loan, whatever it is, do what you got to do to get it, fix it, get it rented out. Then once it's stabilized to go to the regular uh, banking market and say, great, I now have a fully occupied rental property. I'd like to refinance, please. Take as much money out as you can and still have it work and still have a cash flow. Then take that cash and then go buy your next house, right? Well, one thing to pay attention to, the refinance and cash out refinance timelines have changed. Coleman, I think it's six months now, right? A year. A year, okay. So you need to hold the property for one year after you bought it to be able to do a cash out refinance to get all your money back. Right? That was shorter before, but now just keep in mind that I need to keep it for one year before I can do the refinance. And it doesn't mean you have to do it in cash. That's what other lending platforms are for, right? Uh, but yeah, to, to get traditional refinance, uh, you have that whole period. And then you have interest rates to consider. Rates are what they are. Uh, so... Uh, who was it? Was it Lauren, I think, made the video the other day of buy the house and date the rate. Uh, wait for rates to go down and then refinance again if you need to, right? Always be working on getting 
your borrow costs down while your rents and hopefully property value go up. Uh, wait 10 years, wake up rich. So <laughs> fix what's broken, paint cabinets, we're using LVP, carpet. We don't put in hardwood. We don't put in fancy stuff in our rental house because we're not buying fancy houses in fancy neighborhoods. So LVP and LVT and carpet and painted cabinets work perfectly well in the houses that we're buying for rent. Unless it's STR. Unless it's STR, this is not short-term rental we're talking about. This is not Airbnb, this is long-term rental. Yeah. When you, like you have two comparable homes, same size, and, and one is really decked out, like super nice renovated, and one is just normal, you're not gonna get that much more rent. It's really not, you're not gonna get, get your cash back out. For sure. Yep. Uh, yeah, and again, the only exception is if it's already just trashed anyway, and I have to renovate it, then we might renovate a little bit nicer because the delta between uh, a cheap cabinet and a nicer cabinet, the delta between a laminate countertop and a quartz countertop isn't that bad if you've got to gut it anyway. I'm not gonna make that extra $800 back, maybe if I don't have to right now, but over like 10 years I will, because you will get a little bit more rent for a place that's nicely renovated. So if you've got to do it anyway, then we do a, a, a reasonable job uh, on renovating, but mostly we'll patch if we can patch, we'll fix if we can fix, we'll glaze if we can glaze, and we'll always paint if a thing will look a little bit better with paint and then still be rentable until its lifespan is completely eaten up and then you replace it. Uh, all right, so let's talk about property management, how uh, I approach property management. I have rental property, I'm a professional landlord, have not once ever uh, personally uh, answered a call about mice or a toilet or a light or the power or the whatever. Uh, it's just not my thing. Um, but in order to do that, somebody else has to be taking the calls for when the power goes out or the toilet quits working or they see a rat or whatever uh, the case may be. I actually heard from our property manager the other day uh, that a tree came down during the storm and split their rental house in half. Uh, so they're looking for a builder for their client uh, to perhaps replace their uh, rental property. But anyway, stuff happens. Rent's got to be collected. Uh, if uh, you're interested in having someone else do that, that's property management and property managers then will charge you on average somewhere between seven and 10% of your gross rents um, on an ongoing monthly basis. And then at turnover, so when one tenant leaves, you need to go find a new one to be uh, put in somewhere between one half to one month's rent. So that's kind of the going price range for a, a qualified quality property manager. If you need one of those, please ask us, we know them. Uh, we're partnered with them, uh, but somewhere in seven to ten percent, depending on where it is, how much hand holding the property needs, and you need as an owner, and what services you're looking for, and that half month to one month of rent at turnover is what it costs you. But for that, if your deal can afford that, I get a call every once in a while. I get an email, ping, the thing's not working. I run a construction company. I don't have to go fix my own units. Property manager takes care of that. He's got a guy, and unless it gets really expensive, I'm really concerned about what it's going to cost. I don't need to worry about it. All of that gets done. If you want to pocket that difference though, fine, you're gonna be saving seven to 10% off the top of your gross and then a half to one month's uh, rental every time that the place turns over and you have to put somebody in it. You will just have to deal with calls about the things not working or I can't come up with the rent this month or can I move out in June instead of January or whatever it is. You'll get to answer uh, all of those questions. Yeah. I believe in property management because property management allows me. Yeah, Sloan's answered those calls before. Property it's management like, allows so me like... <laughs> to to do what I'm good at: run my business, look for deals, network, and talk to people. I'm not good to get to a second level. Uh, of it's, network. Oh, sorry. It's but, um, again about your time, right? Maybe I'm at this uh, time uh, a point in my career where I'm ready to just have this as free time. But also, maybe I'm actually can do something that I can make more money with my time. Maybe I'm spending X number of hours a month dealing with problems that come up and I can spend that X hour a month finding new deals, right? So maybe you get to a point in your career where this is not a cost versus it's an investment, right? Just like hiring an employee that's gonna make you more money, I'm hiring property management, that's right. so I can go make more money. Exactly right, that's a good way to think about it. Your property manager is your employee. Uh, and that, that's a good way to think about it on a few levels. Yes, a property manager probably doesn't look after your property the same way you might if you are a professional uh, property manager yourself. So they still need oversight. They're supposed to be producing reports for you and make sure that tenants are dealt with and make sure that problems are solved and things are fixed. 
But that's usually the bulk of it is a good oversight over a property manager that hopefully you got referred to because they already do good work for other people. Usually it's a heck of a lot less work than doing it yourself. So that few thousand dollars a year that it costs for an average rental property to be professionally property managed by someone else to me is well worth it, but that's, that's what it costs. And that's what it does. One of the most important uh, things that they do uh, are the credit and background checks when your place is vacant and needs a new tenant in it. You can do your own, right? Yeah. How do we get uh, background checks on people? Um, right, there are websites that you can sign up for, Rent Spree and Zillow does it too, where a tenant goes there. When you sign up and have your property there, tenant goes there, pays 30 to like $50 for their application fee. They run their credit background and credit, uh, credit and background mm -hmm. check. Uh, so you get that report. You can get that professionally. Make sure you always do that. Property managers use their own resources or websites, but if you're looking for two. I, and by the way, I just, we say it, it always do that. But do we always do that, landlords out here? Yeah. Do we, or do we always run criminal background checks on our tenants? Do we? Do you, Sloan? You run criminal background checks on all of your tenants? Yeah. I mean, I do it through John, but yeah. You have a property manager that helps you get the, the report, right? Uh, Far too often we just way. say, well, you should do that. And I'm telling you, one of the worst things about being your own landlord is fake it. All right, getting somebody, get somebody, put the thing on the thing, get a couple of people, run them over there, stick them in the thing, and don't run the background checks and don't run the credit checks. And then wonder why eight months later it all goes pear shaped and people aren't paying the rent and they're throwing ragers in the thing and they're throwing your place up. If you can do it, great, do it. Go on Mr. Landlord, go on Zillow, go wherever you have to go pull those things, and then be prepared to tell people the hard thing, yeah, check your thing out. I don't really like the background check. Sorry, we're going with somebody else. By the way, when you do that, you turn somebody down for credit reasons. You have to, by law, give them a letter. You're prepared to do that. You have to tell somebody, hey, I ran your credit check, and you don't qualify based on your credit versus someone else that we're choosing. Automatically means you have to send them some kind of piece of information. I don't even know what it is. I don't know what the law is. I just know my property manager does that for me. But if you are willing to do all of that for a couple thousand dollars a year, you will save those couple thousand dollars a year. But don't just hear us say, yeah, and do that and run your criminal and uh, credit checks. Run your criminal background in credit checks. And let me cut through the rest of it on property management. I never want to be the person on the other end of the phone. It's, ah, oh, that's terrible. I, I broke my leg. My kid is sick. My wife's got cancer. My dog just died and my car broke down. Can you give me till next Wednesday to pay the rent? I'm a terrible sob story person, right? I, I feel too bad for everybody. But this is my business. And if I can't pay uh, for the mortgage, you're going to lose your house anyway. But I don't have to say that. My property manager does. Like, yeah, I get it. I'm sorry. That, that sounds terrible. This is not my house. This is not my call. If your rent's not here on the first, 10 days later, you get a notice. If the rent's not here on day number 11, you get an evict. If that doesn't work by day number 30, we're in court and your ass is on the street at day 45. And it's not because we're mean people. This is a business. I work for someone. This is how it has to be. And if you can't have that conversation, then you must pay somebody to have that conversation for you because you will go bankrupt if all you do are buy houses, rent it out to people and let every sad story defer your rent and keep you from doing what you need to do. And I will end up buying your house from you because one of the people we target are unhappy landlords, right? But write that down. You want a really good target market? Other landlords who have done it wrong and have been stiffed and have to chase and have terrible tenants and have their house torn up, they will beg you to buy their property from them. But then don't screw it up for yourself. Get a property manager. So what you're manager. saying is stick with the rules, like the rules you set for yourself. Like I'm gonna you know, check the background every time. I'm gonna you know, do X, Y, and Z, do that all the time. I have a story around this. So we had a, before uh, I was part of Casa, I was at Long and Foster, we had a listing for sale for $2 million. And this wasn't selling, right? And the, uh, the team I was part of, we decided to take on a, a tenant, right? To bring to this house. And the wife was an agent. And in instead of accepting cashier check, we accepted personal checks for secure deposit and first month's rent. Well, it bounced and a house that we couldn't sell and now like there's a tenant in it that's not leaving right what do you tell the owner right so stick with and it was the owner's decision to take their personal check but stick with the rules you have versus well this is a special occasion i'll, I'll make one difference for that yep good yep. advice 
Yes. Just, a, just, just a philosophical. And it's seven almost. Seven. Okay, philosophical question about running a business, right? Yep. This is just. Why don't most more small business owners hire a property manager to run their business? A okay. small business owner or a landlord? I don't... Small business owner. I want you to. I want small you guys... business owner that owns real estate. No, I want you guys to connect the dots. Here's what I find. This is anybody that flips houses or is a wholesaler or is an agent, right? They're oftentimes in the doing. They're terrible business owners. They, they, they allow salespeople to not sell stuff. So what they do is that they run it like that non-professional, you know, owner mm -hmm. instead of hiring a general manager to run their business got you general manager general manager all right, right? you said property manager yeah, i did but i'm trying to connect general you manager. got gotcha. you yeah yeah right yeah yeah, yeah. And, 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 and all I'm, businesses are largely the same yeah and i'm only saying this because when you start looking at your piece of property as a piece of uh, uh like a business it is a business right now every asset is a business it has a PL attached to it and there's a general manager, AKA the property manager that runs that business for you. And your job is to manage that property manager. And you now get back all of your time to go focus on higher dollar productive activities. And so any of you that run businesses here are oftentimes that really bad owner that's trying to do it all themselves. Well, you know, in our business, we also look at like your strengths, your, your personality, like we run disc personality profiles to hire people that join our company. And usually as an entrepreneur, you're more driven, you're more entrepreneurial, you're all, more like, I'm gonna go out there and make things happen. When a property manager is more cautious, is more good with systems and numbers, it's a different personality. So it's usually the operation side of your business, right? You have the, the, the salespeople, I mean, sales, like I'm horrible at the operation piece, I've done it in the past, but you need somebody like somebody who's a director of operations is really good at running a property manager business management business, right? So I might be the right personality for that. And I might say, this is my strength. I might say, no, this is not. So be honest with yourself, right? If it's not your strength, if you're really trying to do something that's going to take a lot of your time and energy. I'm going to go change our meetup description. Uh, come for the real estate chit chat, stay for the entrepreneurial business training. Um, uh, but the point is well taken. These are businesses, run it like a business. Coleman, you had a point. Yeah. So I, my question, I think, is like on this slide right now. But I was going to say, if you have somebody that has good, uh, like, like rent multiple, um, clean background check, and the last thing you're looking at is credit. Um, say they're maybe even they have 100% on time payments, but they're this number is really low. Like, mm -hmm. what, do you have a number cut off mm -hmm. that you're looking for? Or is it kind of case by case based on what you're seeing in the report? Yeah. <laughs> uh I, I don't have a cutoff number because that's your property manager's job it was well, the property manager's job to sift through all the uh applications and then say these are the top three and so one of the differences in the top three might be credit but i guess my my point would be if you have credit under 700 and you do have a perfect rent payment background elsewhere somebody didn't get paid that's why it's 700 right so at some point you weren't good with credit somewhere so there does need to be a a floor and so if i had uh a uh 700 credit good landlord references uh no pet and 770 credit good landlord references and a pit bull I'm still taking the pit bull in 750 uh, rather than 700. So I don't know that it's necessarily that I have a number. Dude, yeah. it's not that I have a number. 100% uh, no. I think he's about to go watch it. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm just, so, I'm so, so well, this, this, tell, this is a landlord, landlord chat. Mark has 800 plus credits, first and foremost, right? Correct. <laughs> Correct. 700 is like a low number. Well, that's actually a good number. When it comes to the rent, obviously he doesn't manage his own property. <laughs> <laughs> I see the application uh, because because eight hundred credit people. Here's here's your takeaway. They don't uh, rent usually. We'll we'll get to the slide as to as to why and how you get eight hundred credit people. Eight hundred credit people live eight hundred credit lots. Yeah, that's the takeaway. I don't care what they do. 
800 credit people live 800 credit lives. Right. And, and 500 credit people live 500 credit lives. So, so I don't disagree. That's saying that's 700 is actually a really good credit score. Well, you know, the numbers are different now, right? The max now is like 850. So, so I think one other thing we need to pay attention to, Coleman, is like somebody who has low credit versus somebody who's maxed out all of their, their credit, right? Somebody who's maxed out all their credit is looking for money, right? Like they're trying to like, like, oh, go, maybe go up, well, man. Also, maybe they've applied for too many inquiries recently. They're trying to find another credit card that they can live off of. So just like a bank, when you have a lot of inquiries, they stop giving you credit cards because they realize you're trying to just find money, like do the same thing, right? Like how much credit do they have available outside of like just missed payments, those two things. Can together. I give you an example? So yeah. I, I have the property vacant right now, trying to find a person for it. 800, 700 credit people are usually buying houses compared to, uh, and so- It's right, 700 credit people, right? 700 people. Oh, buying houses. Out. Okay, let's do I'll do a credit, you know, 620, I'll do one for you. But yeah. um, so they have great, they, 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 they just got out of a divorce for one thing. And so they've had to, they run up their credit utilization to the max. So you're right, they need a lot of money, there's inquiries. That's why it's low. They have 100% on-time payments. They have a great new salary at their new job because they finished school and they've got a great, you know, great rent multiple, background checks, totally clear, um, quarter million dollars of student loan debt. And <laughs> so the payments, uh, the DSCR, like, like if you look at their debt to income, it's still good, like they make great money. But even though 100%, on time payments, their credit is below 600. It's like 570 oh, wow. just because of the credit utilization. Yeah. I wonder if I should run. Well, I mean, if you look at case by case, case, you know, usually don't people don't want to get evicted, right? So somebody who has history of like making payments, I can look at it case by case. So in those mm -hmm. cases, what you can do is just six months security deposit, three months security deposit, mm -hmm. case by case. You know, my client is 550 only, he's not getting I will pay out four years security deposit. Yeah. I think in Virginia, the maximum security deposit is two months. two months. Yeah, the maximum you can collect as a landlord is two months. And you should never collect rent upfront. Somebody might say, just give me the whole rent upfront, then you can't evict them. So never, if you go to a company, if you go to Exo here and say, I will just pay the whole rent upfront, they won't take it. You just have to pass their uh, application. So don't collect rent upfront and maximum in Virginia is two months of security deposit. I don't know about other states. But I mean, a lot of clients who's less than 600, they are not able to find the people on, on front like six, six months, three months, you know, and they're very expected to land. What you can do uh, in lieu of just a normal rental in that case is maybe do a rent, a lease option. So you know what? Uh, you're going to buy this. Uh, this is like tenant. At this price, at this strike price, I will give you an option to buy. Then you can collect whatever amount you negotiate. You can collect a higher amount per month. You can say market rents two grand. You can pay twenty five. Now that twenty five, I'll take a hundred of it. I'm gonna put it in uh, an account for you. And then we get there. Maybe you buy this as an option. Of course, you have to sell it if everything comes together. But that never happens. You know, they say that the two months that. is the is the is the max, but Who's checking? Number one. Rob is being recorded. Okay, no, I <laughs> the attorneys will be checking. Yeah, yeah. And what are the penalties? I guess is the question. Like, what's the penalty for collecting? Grief? Yeah. So here we're giving you what you should do the right way. Obviously, there's a lot of creative ways that we can yeah. do things. But again, what we're saying is there's always a solution. Like, if I if I talk to the person, if I look at the whole application as a whole, like. Look at patterns. If there's a lot of patterns that have repeated, like if there's just like they went through a divorce and everything fell apart, but before that everything was good, that's a different different story than oh man, there's this pattern that's coming up every couple of years, right? And hit the next slide because I think I want to make. Yeah, oh no, it's right here. Yeah, it was right there. Sorry, go back one. Yeah, keep rents below market to encourage renewals and better tenants. Uh, the best thing you can do for yourself is if the market rent for a home in your condition in the neighborhood is $2,500 a month, try to make your numbers work at 24 and watch what happens. Tenants will slit your throat to save $50 a month if they can get a better deal and move somewhere else, right? If they feel like they've got the best deal in the neighborhood, though, number one, on the way in the door, you're going to get 50 applications. 
Not my problem. Property manager gets to go through that. And of those 50, he picks the top three and I get 750 plus people that don't have pit bulls that just happen to be in between houses or in between situations or move new to the area or haven't decided where they want to buy, haven't met a cause group agent that's been able to get them qualified yet, whatever. I don't care. They're high quality people and they don't leave. I can raise the rent, but I don't. We keep rents slightly below market and no one ever leaves. We, you know, how long, what's your longest tenant problem? 16 years. 16 years. You know how much paint and carpet he saved over 16 years? I maintain or don't his houses. Mm -hmm. Nothing. You spend, you spend very, very, very little when people don't move out. Vacancy is what kills you as a landlord. So cost yourself $1,200 a year by being $100 a month below market rent. And thank me in five years when your tenants haven't moved out and you haven't had to repaint and recarpet and refresh and re put a person in, spend two or three weeks finding them losing rent, spending a month's worth of rent to your property manager to put the new guy in there. Sorry, property managers. They may not like that. They'll tell you, hey, raise the rent, raise the rent. Because every time the tenant moves out, they get another month, put another tenant in there. That's okay. They'll, they'll still live. They'll still eat. Keep your rent slightly below market and thank you later. Yes, sir. Uh, don't worry about the tenant wrecking the property and they have credit issues, one thing you do is, is uh, pull a college town uh, and ask someone to co-sign. They can find someone that can watch for their credit yep. and you're not worried about their pet bull wrecking the property, wrecking the carpets or anything, then you get a bus for it. Co-signers, right? We do that with lending all the time. Sorry, your credit's not quite good enough. Who do you know that's got better credit that we can put on this loan with you that I've got somebody that does care about their credit and they will make sure this thing gets repaid. Or in your case, they will make sure that our unit is treated well and that the rent gets paid. Absolutely, that's one of those solutions, right? You find a way to make the thing look better and, and meet your requirements. Yeah, we got about 10 minutes for, for, for a long-term right. tenant. Um, uh, do you still over time periodically raise the rent a bit, still keep it below market, of course. but you still do periodically of course. raise rent? Yeah, the, the rent goes up. That's one of the greatest things about uh, rental real estate. The rent always goes up. Every once in a while, it stays flat. Every once in a while, in the bottom of the worst recession, and there's tons of inventory out there, maybe you might have to drop a little. But depending on where your market is, almost always, uh, and certainly over more than a five or six year period, rent always goes up. And in a high inflation uh, period, like we're in now, rent goes up faster. Have I been renting lately? and had to try to rent the place. Uh, not the name names of Skylar, had to practically murder people uh, <laughs> to find decent housing uh, in the area, right? It's hard. Uh, so it is uh, a landlord favorable market when uh, times are tough because people need places to live and they have to move out of their houses and we've run into people that had to do short sales and foreclosures and other stuff. And it's a landlord favorable market when times are good and inflation is high because rents go up. So to me, raise the rents to an amount so they don't move out. Like if you think I'm going to raise it by like hundred bucks, they're going to move out, raise it by 50. And when my clients reach out to me and say, say, what should I do? I actually say, here are the comps, show it to your tenant and say, okay, comps are 2,500, but I'm making you making it 2,450. So they see they're getting a deal, right? Show them the market and chart, show them you're giving them a deal. Yep. Uh, we got right. a low cons consumer. So uh, loan chat, this is good stuff. Like this, this is like the, the nitty gritty stuff where, uh, People who own property will hopefully tell you what's worked and what hasn't worked, and hopefully that keeps you out of trouble. So anything like that, anybody has a question about, how does this work? How do we get rid of this person? How do we take the doors off? How do I kill them? Stop us, ask the question, because it's good chat. So uh, let's talk about how you finance these things, though. Uh, you are typically financing property uh, requiring at least 25% down to get the good rates. Would you agree, roughly, good rates that started about 25% down? Yeah, yeah, well, at least 20 at least 20, right? Let's say 20 is kind of the, the minimum threshold to get the better rates. You can maybe get loans at less than 20% down, but I don't know, do you, do you have a sense for, is there's the general rule lender guys, how much the rate goes up if I'm trying to put 15% down instead of 20? Is there a standard deviation? Uh, my rate is commercial frozen line is 20. Um, Would you ever consider one? Is it with another? Uh, the only time you would consider it is if you were going to collateralize another property and then the overall loan value okay. um, uh, goes down. One borrower, one one house, 
twenty percent minimum to to have the conversation about a loan. Generally, yeah. But just to make sure, because a lot of people, so you guys require minimum twenty, but there are investment loans you can get out there with less than twenty. Yes. Yeah. Yep. You got higher fees, higher rates. Sure. But, yeah, right. but if you want to use a number, use twenty five, and know that you can probably get a decent loan even at twenty percent down. But that's thing you got to have. Uh, ten properties still confirm con conforming, Fannie Freddie, right? So up to ten, uh, you can get good old fashioned Fannie Freddie back the cheapest money possible, thirty year terms. Uh, in your name, 10 for you, 10 for a spouse, 10 for your business partner, any individual person can get up to 10. After that, you're maxed out with Fannie Freddie, and now you have to go to some other kind of, uh, not necessarily uh, a DSCR loan, but you'll have to move to something other than a Fannie Freddie backed sell on Wall Street, cheapest possible loans, right? They just, they get more expensive after uh, 10. Uh, but get your 10 uh, as a Fannie Freddie loan when you can. Uh, the conforming loans usually need to be owned personally, as in not in an LLC. The Fannie Freddie ones, the absolute cheapest money, is backed by you and your personal credit, right? You can get loans that aren't in your name. They just cost more. So tell people, if you're starting out, get the cheapest ones. Have to be in your name. There are reasons that you won't want them in your name. There are ways to get them out of your name different chat for maybe uh, after the, the already over 45 minutes for how you can do that. Uh, but the cheap stuff in your name, uh, anything uh, LLC or not 20% down or no longer conforming because you've already got your 10 or you want to get it financed now and you don't want to wait the year, you're talking about a different product like DSCR debt service coverage ratio product. Uh, want to give you uh, too much to do, Justin, because I still want you to come back with those pizzas, but you want to chat real quick about what the DSCR product is and does? Yeah, so just speaking from the commercial side, uh, you know, you're going to take the income that uh, is preferably a property that's already leased and you have a lease in place. Uh, you have some historical numbers to look back on and reflect on. Uh, you're going to take the income there, the expenses, and also with 99.999% of commercial loans or small business loans, uh, you are going to have to personally guarantee it. So any fund that has 20% or greater ownership in that LLC will have to provide a personal guarantee. So they're also going to look at your personal income, pay your personal debt, put all that income together from you know what the property is generating, what you generate, maybe you got outside income or something regular W-2 job or whatever you got your tax return, divided by all the debts. So the mortgage on the subject property, and then you know your own mortgage, your own car payments, your own credit cards, your own debt, divide that. Hopefully it's above 1.25 times the higher result is the better. But in a nutshell, that's how it works. So uh, if the uh, principal and interest on the mortgage that you want to take out to buy the thing is a thousand dollars a month. You want to be showing at least one thousand two hundred and fifty dollars a month in income against it. About right? Yeah. Cool. Uh, uh, reserve, Coleman. Uh, last time I checked, six months. Yeah. Pretty pretty standard. Yeah. Uh, so if uh, that principal and interest is that PITI or is that just principal and interest? Yeah. So principal interest taxes and insurance, let's say that costs a thousand dollars for you to own this property, plan on the bank saying, cool, show us where you've got six thousand dollars stuffed away somewhere so that you can continue to pay us if your tenant takes off. Right. Make sure you have that funds available uh, when you go to apply for your loan. That's the thing you got to have. Seventy percent LTV max on a refi. I don't know, probably seventy five is still doable as a refinance that feel right somewhere in that 25 percent debt right so hard money dead uncle wherever you get the money from buy the house take a private loan if you have to then you can refinance out of it just try to get 70 percent for around there pulled out and so what that means if you can buy the house for fifty thousand and it's a wreck you need fifty thousand to fix it up so now you're into it for a hundred after six months or a year, if you're looking for good old fashioned, cheap as possible, Fannie Freddie money, you can get the house to appraise for, let's do a, a little bit of calculator math here, but let's say it's 150, right? What's 75% of 150? Uh, 105. Is that, is that the deal? Is that, uh, is that math working? Yep, 112.5. 
uh, 75 percent. So when it appraises for 150, you'll take out a 112 500 loan. You only had a hundred thousand dollars into the house. You're now twelve thousand five hundred dollars to the good. Plus, you now have the thing uh, rented out and somebody else is paying the rent, right? So that's how you refinance and take money out. And you can do that as many times as you can get a loan. When rates go down, do it again. Rates go down, do it again, right? And pull your cash out and put it into something else as long as the rents are still paying for that EITI. Oh, cool. What did we learn? I can, did we get it under? We didn't even come close to an hour. I'm sorry, people. There's a lot to cover. And there may be more. About that. <laughs> and there may be more, but where are the gaps now? What questions do you have after hearing that and saying, all right, how do I get these things bought? How do I get them uh, uh, rented out? And how do I make it so that somebody doesn't steal all my money and burn my house? So because we want to have time for networking, let's spend 10 minutes maybe going over questions. So, or things you've learned, go ahead. I'll try to get quite yeah. less 10 minutes. Yeah, he's out of your personal name. All right, so real quick, um, you can deed a property via what's called a quit claim deed into a limited liability company. Let me back up for a second. I always feel like, uh, uh, Sheldon on the big bank there, you're trying to explain physics to Penny. It was a cold, it was a warm evening, and Plato looked up at the stars. <laughs> We're always backing up. Uh, a limited liability company is like giving birth to a person. Uh, a limited liability company can do things, it can sign things, it can take on obligations, it can make promises, and when promises get broken, it gets in trouble, not you. That's the gist of what a limited liability company is. It's like a baby that you control. But it's out there doing stuff. I guess that makes it like a teenager getting in trouble for stuff. What the keys to your car? It it suffers the consequences, not you. Assuming it was structured properly, assuming you run it properly, conversation for a different night. What you can do though, once that LLC is formed, is you can quit claim deed of property into that LLC and say, all right, LLC, you now own the property. Mark no longer owns one two three Main Street. I go to closing. I get a title company to agree. Write it down. Put it in the land records. 123 Main Street LLC now owns this property. And so if anybody falls down the stairs, house burns down, throw a raging party and somebody gets stabbed, I'm, I'm mad at the owners of uh, 123 Main Street. Yeah, cool, you got a real beef, buddy. You're mad at 123 Main Street LLC. Go sue them, can't sue me. That's what it does for you, ostensibly. Uh, how you get there is through that quick claim deed. One big hang up with that could be, however, if you do have a loan and you went to somebody and said, hey, give me a loan uh, for this property, please. They'll say, great, you want the best possible rates, put it in your name, run your credit, you vouch for it, personally guarantee it, great, sign away. Loans in your name and you quit claim deed ownership of the property into an LLC if or when your lender were to discover that you have deeded ownership of the property into an LLC that they didn't underwrite, they didn't make a loan to this LLC, they made a loan to you, they may, and if you have a loan done in the last 50 years, you almost certainly do have in your loan documents what's called a due on sale clause. And when you sell or transfer ownership, not really even just sell, ownership, when you transfer ownership, which is what I did, I took it out of my name and I quit claim deeded it into an LLC. Technically, lender finds out about that, they're able to say, uh, we didn't loan the money to this thing. You have 30 days to either pay off my entire loan or get this thing back in your name at their option uh, because we're not cool with this thing that you did. That is a real risk written into every deed of trust document that I've ever seen written. I don't know what the landlord ownership is here for the quick show of hands, but just what we've got, Anybody here ever lost a house through due on sale? I haven't, but I thought, maybe I'm um, incorrect about this. I thought a law was passed to uh, prevent bank from doing that if you do it to an LLC or over a person, something like that. Either way, even if, even if I am incorrect, uh, wouldn't you be able to, um, what is it, uh, do a land type of land trust? trust? Land trust. All right. To go around that? I don't know how much time we've got. No. Uh, you said 10 minutes. It's not good. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Like, there, there, are, there are nuanced answers here. The short answer to your question is how do you limit your liability for owning this thing? The easiest way is just a crap ton of insurance. 
uh, very rarely is there a problem that exceeds the limit of a, of a good landlord policy. First of all, always be honest with your insurance company. This is what I'm doing. This is where it is. You want to know the rent? You want to know, tell me what you need to know to over-insure this property to the best degree that you can, and then get an umbrella policy on top of that that protects you. Anyone that does this for a living, flips houses, buys rental real estate, wholesales, Short -term doing any of this sure. stuff, any of it, you should have an umbrella policy that covers you personally for minimally a million dollars. Unless you've burnt down a bunch of houses in your life, that won't cost you that much money. So get the most coverage you can and then get an umbrella policy on top of that. That's thing number one. You do those things and that will cover 99% of the situations you'll ever be in where you have to pay because someone's gotten hurt in a property you own. But for the other 1%, if you're concerned about protecting about the other 1%, that's what a limited liability company is for. Just know that there are due on sale clauses. That is what land trusts can be for. A land trust is a means is a paper means to own real estate, but land trusts have no liability protection attached to them. That is why the limited liability company exists. A land trust is strictly a means to have property real estate owned by something other than a person, but it's not a limited liability company for asset protection and liability protection purposes. But you can combine those two things, but that's gonna be another half an hour of how you combine those two things to both get it out of your name and keep a bank from getting upset about it. And I stand like, corrected. Daisy chain those things. Um, that does trigger the do on sale, and in the same sense, uh, land trust does go around it. I just looked that up. It, yeah. it's, it is possible, but let's have that conversation offline if anyone wants to know how land yeah. trust works. Uh, it's, can I just it's interject okay. on something real fast yeah. so people like connect the dots? So, yes, uh, the do on sale clause option is there. Um, Highly likely it would ever get called. Unlikely. Unlikely. Yeah, highly unlikely that unlikely would get called. But there's a possibility it exists. But you might need clar clarity also on the loan piece. Because if so, if I'm listening to this right now, people might be asking, what happens to the debt that's still there? Right. A lot of times people will say to me, Oh, I want to buy a property in the name of an LLC because they don't want to take on the debt person. But what they need to realize is they're still going to take on the debt first at that point, right? You you might. There is what's called non-recourse financing, where the property is purchased by an LLC. The people in charge of that LLC take no personal responsibility whatsoever for repaying that loan. But you need to be in a slightly different financial position than your average first-time landlord buying a townhouse in Herndon to be able to get a non-recourse, reasonably affordable loan. Is it possible? Absolutely. That's a chat for when we do this as a landlord mastermind for those of us with a dozen properties or more and get commercial lines of credit with hopefully non-recourse debt, but different conversation that's not going to usually happen for the average person buying their first house. Yes, sir. Good question. So loans in your name, you claim into an LLC, yeah. insurance stays in your name or you change it to the LLC? And then insurance companies say, if you have a claim later that it's an under an LLC. Or they sure can. So yes, the insurance follows ownership. Insurance companies insure the owner. They insure the property, but they really insure the owner, right? So once you've transferred ownership, and that's how the banks find out, by the way. Uh, usually you go to the insurance company, hey, uh, this is property is now owned in the name of an LLC. They're like, great. Here's your new policy in the name of the LLC. Rates don't typically tend to change for small single family types of property uh, because the, the casualty loss is still based on the house, but they do need to know who they're insuring, which is a new owner. And the bank has already told them, hey, insurance company, we are separately also insured because we have a deed of trust on this property. You must notify me if you're ever contacted and some shady investor wants to change the name to the LLC. So the bank sends them a notice and says the ownership has changed. What happens with that notice when it gets to the lender? Most of the time, sure balled up and thrown over in the corner because they're not in the business of upturning the apple cart of loans that are performing. Banks have enough to deal with rather than go digging around for loans that are being paid. If they're not, if they're, they don't have any reason to look into it, most of the time they don't, but the right exists, mm -hmm. right? So and then like as I've possible. said, and, and as I have said lately, is their incentive greater 
in an environment where now they're lending at 7% and I borrowed at 2%. And eventually that delta may get big enough that banks decide, well, maybe we can get some of our money back from the knuckleheads that have been transferring ownership and lend it back out into the market at 7%. Just like who's going to enforce your illegal Airbnb? Municipalities are now being approached by companies whose only job is to go through the records and find the illegal Airbnbs and help municipalities shut them down. Could banks discover that there's maybe a service out there that might help them get some of their money back out from properties that have been transferred? Entirely possible. Maybe I should start that. Company. Let's do a one last question here. All right. So, Mr. Pitch, gentlemen, if you are creating a trust, yeah. make sure you create the review type of trust, which you can dissolve at the need. Revocable. If you create irrevocable, yeah. you cannot dissolve by That's the right. That's so right. That is a key thing. Yep. When you put uh, a property into a land trust, it will make it much more difficult to sell. No bank anywhere wants to dig into your trust records. So you usually need to pull it out when you go to sell. And that means the trust needs to be revocable so you can undo what you've done uh, and change terms. But again, longer discussion about how trusts work. Uh, you should have trust attorneys involved in those things. If you need one of those, we know people. Let us know. Uh, we can connect you to the people who can help uh, with those kinds of structures and things. Join Facebook group. Yeah, so, so I that, see uh, grit, Facebook group.com, grit FB group.com. It's right there, very easy. If you're not part of the meetup group uh, for this grit uh, local chapter, go sign up for that because we do send out like local deals that we have or certain announcements that actually might help you make money. So if you're not part of the meetup group, uh, let me know. Come, come over here, see me. I'll help you sign up. Um, other than that, we're going to spend some time networking right now. Uh, sure. So make sure you collect information, get with the people that are actually like that you want to meet today, but don't do that just tonight. Schedule a cup of coffee, follow up with them afterwards. That's where the money is made in the follow up. Mark, anything mm -hmm. else before we wrap up? I think Probably. that's I think that's it. Anybody has any other questions about stuff? Be here for Come a bit. Let's hang out.